Hello there, I'm Manuela Lazic, film critic, actress, and filmmaker, and this is Take Two, a series where we look at some of the greatest performances in cinema to try and figure out what makes them so great. Today we're looking at the amazing cast of George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. This 1978 horror film is the director's sequel to his 1968 debut feature, Night of the Living Dead, and has become a beloved film in itself. A definitive restoration of the film was just released by Second Sight here in the UK, and I was lucky enough to contribute to the booklet writing about masculinity. To be clear, this is not product placement. I will not get a penny if you buy this box set. I just think it's a beautiful object. In Dawn of the Dead, Romero updates his zombie story for the consumerist age, but what I find so special about this film is how its themes are truly articulated for the actors' performances. The film follows four characters who together find refuge from a zombie apocalypse in a large shopping mall, seemingly a perfect spot when all you need is food and shelter. And luckily for them, they are a rather promising bunch. Two of them are SWAT team members, called Peter and Roger, while the third man is Steven, who gets them to the mall with the helicopter he usually pilots to do his traffic reports, and his girlfriend, TV executive Francine. However, like the zombies who are instinctively attracted to the mall because it used to matter a great deal to them, some of our protagonists struggle to let go of their individualistic and capitalist ideologies, even after society has collapsed. Sure yet, I'm waiting for word on this. The group has just learned that Fran, played by Galen Ross, is pregnant, which could complicate an already tricky situation and the guys have gone up to the roof to figure out if they can use some trucks parked outside to barricade the entrances to the mall. I like how Romero has set up this scene. Fran is looking up at the guys coming down from the sky like they were angels coming to her rescue, or just men who are used to placing themselves above others. It was Steven, played by David Emge, and not Fran herself who broke the news of the pregnancy to the other guys. And now Fran feels that she's being left out because of that information. When they come down, Ross leans against the wall and stays calm, looking at them from a distance. She seems to be waiting for them to tell her what plan they've come up with, but they don't. So after a pause, she steps forward slowly. I would have made you all coffee and breakfast, but I don't have my pots and pans. I think in a less intelligent film, Ross would have played Fran as overtly angry here. But because Fran is a modern woman in the Western world, she is used to such instances of casual misogyny, so she probably expected to be left out. Instead of rage, Ross uses sarcasm to make the men notice her and feel uncomfortable. Ross looks to the ground when she begins speaking up, and she starts by asking to talk. Uh, May I say something? Sure. Sorry you found out I'm pregnant, because I don't want to be treated any differently than you treat each other. Oh, hey, Frank, come on. And I'm not going to be dead mother for you guys. There's a sense that Fran is trying to stay calm, even as she's annoyed. And I want to know what's going on, and I want to have something to say about the plans. There's four of us, okay? To act, you need to have clear goals. And Ross's goal here is to get the others to understand that she will not let them cast her out. You can adopt different strategies to reach your goal. And Ross's strategy here is to be clear and authoritative without losing her temper. Fran. This face is almost comical to me. And Romero did say he wanted the film to have a comic book quality, but there's also something disappointing about Steven's response. He's annoyed by Fran's request to be a part of the team. The way M.G. stares at Ross is full of irritation. His goal in this scene was to be a strong man protecting his girlfriend, and Ross's remarks undermine that. He looks like a child angry at his mom for ridiculing him in front of his friends. Fair enough. When Peter, played by Ken Forey, taps him on the shoulder and says fair enough, MD looks away as though he were ashamed. He feels emasculated by his girlfriend. Okay, now what's going on? We're going out. And you're not coming with us. And you won't come with us until you learn how to handle yourself. Peter, however, reacts more pragmatically. He tells Fran she can't join them until she's learned how to handle herself, which I take to mean until she knows how to fight off zombies. Forey talks to Ross directly and calmly. Here we see that Fran and Peter are much readier than Steven to let go of old masculine ideals of independence and strength, and conceptions of the feminine as powerless and weak, and adapt to the new circumstances. Something else. I don't know about you two, but I want to learn how to fly that helicopter. Fran is again being logical, 
She's also understandably scared, and Ross's eyes widen with fear. Now, we anything don't know happens those to you, we have to be able to fly out of here. Yet Stephen takes Fran's remark badly. Emgi rolls his eyes and looks down as if he'd been punched in the stomach, because Stephen feels humiliated. He's heard that his girlfriend doesn't believe he can protect her. A caring but nevertheless sexist ideal, especially in such a high-risk context. She's right, man. Fran turns to Stephen and talks rationally, and Peter is on her side. He also agrees with her for a third time when she asks to have a gun as well. Come on, let's go. And I don't want you to leave me without a gun again. But the look he shoots at Stephen is interesting, I think. It's a visual way of repeating, she's right, but there's also something in his silence. He's implying that Stephen needs to provide her with a gun, but he's also distancing himself from the bad vibes between them. Again, he's not interested in the conservative construct of the couple, and certainly not in seeing a man cling to it so desperately. Forrest's goal is to get the team working, not to take care of everyone's feelings. Similarly, Roger, played by Scott H. Ranniger, is totally on the sidelines for this entire scene. When Peter calls for him, we can see that he's been staring at a wall, and he stands up comically to run to the action. Let's go. As we'll see later, Roger is attached to other old ideas. Uh, become difficult at times to stay on the air, but we're making every attempt to do that. Steven's resentment is now obvious. MD slams the rifle and the bullets on the cardboard box in front of him and looks at Fran intently. In his mind, she's ruined his plan of being one of the guys. I just might be able to figure out how to use it. I'm sorry, Steven. When she responds with a self deprecating joke, he stays silent, so Ross changes tactic. To make him not mad at her, she goes from humor to apology. But the way Ross says sorry is revealing about their relationship. She doesn't look at him, and her tone is a bit cold. She doesn't seem to mean it. It looks as though she's used to having to apologize for making him feel weak. Perhaps even in normal circumstances, Stephen tends to feel that she doesn't respect him as a man. It's all right. It's all right. Stephen? Ross is much more convincing here. Although Fran doesn't want to rely on Stephen for protection, she still really wants him to survive. MD's call reply, however, suggests that he still cares more about his wounded ego than about how she cares for him. Romero's reverse shot on Fran's concealed profile emphasizes the distance between them. It's this kind of little backstory that makes Dawn of the Dead so much richer than your typical horror movie. It becomes a film about human nature and relationships, with actors that have much more interesting work to do. Where's Flyboy? Where's his 20? Fly! Hey, Ross! Hopefully up in the roof. With Flyboy. Peter and Roger are driving trucks to block the doors of the mall, while Steven supervises from his helicopter, and Fran looks on. Come on, come on, man! Roger is having a lot of fun, and Reiniger's physicality is key to depicting that. It's through his body that Roger experiences his superiority over the zombies. He laughs and he even plays with this aliveness when he freezes and lets a zombie touch his face for a second. Reiniger wants to have as much fun as possible, and it feels like Roger is savoring the opportunity to fight people that are weaker than him. His yeehaws reveal that he feels like a real cowboy in a world where the line between good and bad people is starker and killing is allowed. Peter's face, meanwhile, reveals that he's annoyed. They're supposed to do their job, not have fun. When Peter saves him, Reiniger's reaction is amazing. His purpose now is to take in what has just happened and let the shock of it impact him. So he stares at the blood on his hands and tries to wipe it off his face. Roger is stunned, realizing that he almost died. But I think he also understood something else. Having a zombie die right on top of him 
has reminded him that these creatures used to be people of flesh and blood, just like him. Roger insists on killing the second zombie that attacks him, and Reiniger has a crazy look in his eyes. In this moment, the actor wants to show both that zombie and himself who's the boss. It's an act of revenge and reassurance. When Roger mutters, bastards, bastards, his voice is quiet and almost shaky, like he's trying to surmount his own fear, and he seems dazed. Roger? We got him, didn't we? Then, when he says, we got him by the ass, we got this by the ass. He switches back to being excited, and even more so than before. Let's go, baby. Number two. You all right? Perfect, baby. Perfect. Reiniger delivers his perfect, baby, perfect with an almost menacing tone, and he looks to the road with mad determination. Even Peter is freaked out. Roger's brush with death has made him feel even more superior to the undead and determined to destroy them. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. What? My bag. I left my goddamn bag in the other truck. All right, Trooper. You better screw your head on. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Let's go. I mean it, man. Here, Peter gives Roger another reality check. Forry is again being authoritative and direct, and he physically forces Reniger to pay attention to him. He changes Reniger's mood, and Roger is shaken out of his bloodthirsty stupor. Now you're not just playing with your life, you're playing with mine. Now are you straight? To act, you need to follow clear goals, but you also need to react, which means you have to listen to your scene partner. Because Reniger truly listens to what Forry is clearly telling him, he really takes it in. He looks down, then up into Forry's eyes, to tell him he understands, and perhaps to look for his forgiveness. But again, Forry doesn't care about emotions. He just starts the truck and gets moving, letting Reniger take responsibility for the tension between them. Unfortunately, despite this moment of lucidity, Roger will soon get bitten by zombies. His selfish enjoyment of killing Freddy will, ironically, cost him his life. In a surprising but rather fun turn of events, a biker gang who's been surviving on the road breaks into the mall to have a field day, taking objects but also playing at killing zombies. Stephen and Peter have come down from their hiding place to keep an eye on them, but Stephen can't stand to watch the carnage. In acting terms, you could say that Emgi here loses sight of his original goal. Instead of letting the bikers do their thing and discreetly going up to the balcony, he is too disturbed by their rampage on the mall. His goal changes, and he decides to intervene. As we saw in the first scene, Stephen is characterized as someone who's quite sensitive and still attached to the old principles that, before the apocalypse, gave the world some kind of sense. This shopping mall doesn't belong to him any more than it does to the bikers, and it's understandable that they'd want to get some food there too. Stephen lets his ego dominate him, again, and acts irrationally. It's ours. We took it. It's ours. But MG has to make this crazy decision make sense to him. You can't act well if you don't mean what you say and do. I think he does a great job. He's really focused because he's genuinely angry and determined. God damn it, Flyboy, what the hell are you doing? After the place, they don't care about us. Because Peter is pragmatic, he's annoyed by Stephen's reaction. He also doesn't expect the bikers to be territorial as well, but they're clearly still attached to the before world. They steal money, as though it still had any value, and take fun objects rather than solely the things they need to survive. The biker's behavior recalls Rogers. The cast is simply having the most fun possible, even as they are killing what used to be people. Like Roger did, they relish their sense of power and the new anarchy. I like how M. Gee plays Stephen's growing fear. He doesn't overdo it, because in reality, when we're afraid, 
We often try not to be for our own sake. Here, MG has to act with what we call an impediment. His character's arm is badly wounded. To be believable, MG has to take that physical factor into account consistently. When the bullet hits Steven, his reaction seems appropriate to me. He shakes and his face distorts in pain. But when he's on the floor, however, he leans on his bad arm. I'm not a doctor, but if his arm hurt as much as it seems to, I doubt he would be able to do that. When he climbs out the shaft, however, MG remembers not to use that arm. MG's goal here is pretty obvious. He wants to get the zombies off his back. Although he's beaten early on, he doesn't give up, which I think is understandable. He's facing an even more horrible death if he lets them eat him alive. Throughout the fight, MG continues to take into account each new bite, and his pain is very credible. Once he's finally alone, his expression changes. The action segment is over, and MG has a new task. Now he has to take stock of what's happened to him. Immediately, he realizes that he's going to die. The determination on his face disappears, and he's replaced by sheer terror and suffering. He shivers, closes his eyes, and tries to catch his breath, which truly makes it look as though his physical and psychological pain has reached a new level. Fran and Peter may be the most rational of the bunch, but as we saw earlier, Fran does care about Steven on a personal level. When she wants to go find him, Ross tries to get Forey to go with her, but he remains distant and unmoved. His goal is to stay put whatever may have happened to Steven. Romero has said that MG was the best zombie he'd ever seen, and I'd agree. The impediment he has to act with here is zombification, which obviously isn't a real-world thing, but zombies in popular culture, and in particular in Night of the Living Dead, had set the standard for what a zombie would act like, at least in a Romero film. One way to approach impediments is to select just a few precise physical actions to stick to that will create the illusion of the impediment. Here we can see that MG has chosen to 1. Keep his eyes half-closed and his mouth agape, 2. Keep his head tilted to the right, and 3 drag his right leg. You can see him stick to those principles as he steps over the corpses in front of the elevator. His zombie acting is much more detailed than that of most of the extras in the film, which makes him much more believable, even as he plays a fantastic creature. Dawn of the Dead remains a shocking and very enjoyable horror film, because its four lead characters make its anti-capitalist message feel truly lived in. Their interactions reveal different ways of viewing the world and human life, and make Romero's concept of the shopping mall zombie movie much more interesting than it sounds. Let me know what you thought in the comments, subscribe, leave a like, and please tell us if there's a film in particular that you'd like me to talk about on here. You can read exclusive essays I'll be writing to accompany each new Tech2 video by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash yougotaact. In case you don't know, on this channel you can also find the You Gotta Act podcast slash show where I talk to people in film about actors they love. Patrons also get to know the guests in advance and ask them a question. See you next time.